Let's bow our heads for a moment. Lord, as we open your word now, we ask your spirit to guide us, to speak to our hearts. Help us to hear what we need to hear in Jesus' name. Amen. How many of you want to get sent to the judge? What? Really? No? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's kind of what I thought. Kind of what I thought. Um, <clears throat> being sent to the judge doesn't usually resonate to us as a positive thing. I'll tell you a little story. Back when I was in college, whoo, yeah, way back there, uh, I was working on a Volkswagen Beetle for a friend of mine. Uh, he had been at PUC where I was, but he'd moved on to some other school, and his car needed to get fixed. I was working on it in the auto shop there, got it fixed up, and giving it a test drive just before I handed it off to his dad, who was going to uh, get it back to him. So my sister and her friend uh, rode along with me down through Napa Valley, and I can't remember... Uh, Rushford or some little town like that. That might not be the right name now. I'm kind of forgetting the names of the towns. But there was a big billboard as you come into town going north. And the highway patrol loved to sit behind the bush, right behind the billboard. And when I forgot to slow down for the town, he was there to greet me. <laughs> so, uh, can I see the registration papers? Well, it's not my car, right? So I dig in the glove box. There's no papers in the glove box. And he said, well, tell you what, I'm going to cut you a break. Because I think I trust you, you're up from the college up there, and I'm not going to take you in for a stolen car. But I am going to write you up for not having the car registered. Because it didn't have current registration on the plates. Well, as soon as I got back to the college and I could get a chance to do so, I got a hold of my friend's dad. And I said, uh, uh, what's the scoop here? <clears throat> and he said, oh, no problem. It's already been registered, but he was living in Arizona here at the time. And so the papers got mailed to him in Arizona. He had them, and he said, when I come by, I'll pick them up. And he sent me copies of the papers. So I took the copies of the papers down to the courthouse and told the clerks, no problem. Th things actually fine. Uh, it's registered, and here's the evidence. They didn't care for the evidence. A citation has been issued and a fine will be paid. That was their attitude. And uh, we went round and round about that for a while until I felt thoroughly intimidated uh, and, and extremely uncomfortable. But I wasn't going to pay a fine for a crime I didn't commit. It was registered at the time he stopped me. It was already registered, not unregistered. Now, if you'd have cited me for speeding, I would not have contested, right? I was. But if you cite me for not registering and it was registered, I'll, I'll point that out. I'll, I'll, I'll point that out. Uh, eventually, it was quite hostile. They were not hearing me at all. So I asked for a copy of the California Vehicle Code. That's a big, fat book. Where do you go? I'm looking, for, I'm looking for escape, right? And I finally found the part that said, you've got to have the registration papers in the car at all times, except for purposes of renewing the registration. That's why they were out. Yes, I just got this open and shut case. So I took that back up to the clerks. A citation has been issued and a fine would be paid. Do you want to work for the county to pay it off? No, no, that's not the point. I just don't. I, I could actually pay it, but I don't think I should. We could have you arrested. No, I'm not really interested in that. Finally, they brought out their big gun and they said, we'll send you to the judge. Woo. Send me to the judge? That was the best news I heard from their lips all day. Send me to the judge. Yes, send me to the judge. I couldn't imagine a judge who couldn't see what I was saying. It's right according to code. That's why it was out. This, this, this should be good. 
Then they said, yeah, but we can't work you until July. They knew I was from the college, and they figured there'd be summer vacation, and I'd be gone and couldn't do it. <laughs> I said, fine, I'm staying here this summer to work. So uh, they put me on the court calendar. Uh, and uh, I got a little letter and said, uh, explain your case and send in your evidence. I explained my case and sent in the evidence. The judge took one look at it and tossed it. One of those secretaries got to call me up and say, the judge tossed your case out. And to myself, I said, you know, you're really lucky they tossed the case. I was going to complain about the way you treat people in the office if I ever stood before the judge. I was pleased to hear the words. I'm sending you to the judge. Why? Because I knew that I could get justice from the judge and it wasn't going to happen any other way. And part of God's judgment is justice for the redeemed. His people have been accused of all kinds of things. The evil and vileness of the rest of the world, they charge on God's people routinely. But they're going to be exonerated in the final judgment. Daniel chapter 7. Verse 21 and 22. I was watching, and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them until the Ancient of Days came, and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High, and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. One of the things that happens in the judgment in heaven is a judgment made in favor of God's saints clearing them of the accusations of their accusers and granting them citizenship and the right to be a part of the government of this earth. Uh, for this time for the saints to possess the kingdom. That's all good news, isn't it? Absolutely good news. There was a day when I was a teenager uh, that my grandmother said to me, man, I'm sure glad you have your head on straight, Jim, not like your cousin, and she named my cousin. Well, he was having trouble all right now. Uh, he was making some bad decisions. Not even his mother knew the whole story of all the trouble he got into. Some of the stuff that he um, did illegally and got caught for in Canada, she never heard about. <laughs> uh, he was not living a good life. But when my grandma said that, I almost cried because I knew what my grandma didn't know. I wasn't doing things outside that my grandma could see, but I was so messed up in my head. I don't think I was really any better off than my cousin. She could see his problems. She couldn't see my problems, but I was so messed up. When we get to heaven, what's my page going to say? Do you know what it's going to say? It's all forgiven by the blood of Christ. If it isn't all forgiven by the blood of Christ, I'm not there. And if I'm there, it's all forgiven. It's a clean sheet. I don't know if I'm going to peek or not. I might, just to make sure. <laughs> I don't have to face my grandmother with embarrassment as a believer. I've sent all that to Christ. He's cared for it. It's done. It's clean. And that's good news. That's good news. For God's people, if we're walking right with him, the judgment is all good news. It's all good news. Now, it is true that there's nothing hidden that will not be revealed. Every work, every secret thing will be revealed in the judgment and brought into the judgment. They, they keep records in heaven. It talks about books. I'm not sure that book is the actual format. We'll find out when we get there, but they, they, they keep records. They, they keep careful records. 
Uh, they know it all. And what do they do with those records? Well, the record of my sins when I confess them and bring them to Christ, uh, they're pardoned. And ultimately, in the final judgment, it's erased. If I still am walking with Christ, it's all erased. It's a clean sheet. Uh, just as if I had always lived the way Jesus always lived. That's the way my record's going to be because my record has been credited with his account. Abraham believed God and it was credited to him for righteousness. Now, Abraham made some mistakes, right? We know some of them. Took a second wife without asking God about that. Uh, lied about Sarah being his sister. Well, she was a half-sister, but that's only a half a truth, and half a truth isn't much of a truth sometimes. And a couple of times she got pulled into somebody's harem because Abraham told lies about their relationship. Uh, and it showed a lack of faith. Um, there are questions that the judgment is going to look at but interestingly the judgment isn't all about us I, I don't know if, if that strikes you uh, as, as um, an awkward reality I think probably there was a day it struck me as an awkward reality. You mean it's not all about us? We, we human beings tend to like things that are all about us. Uh, and uh, I don't know, it, it was fairly recently, Carol and I were talking, when we get to heaven and we walk in and there's unnumbered hosts of redeemed there in heaven. I've always pictured it as unnumbered hosts of redeemed. No, we're not the only ones there. There's hundreds of millions of angels. We can read that in Scripture. They're all there. Visitors from the other planets and worlds throughout the universe all come there. We find that in the book of Job. There's lots of other people up there. We're not the only ones there. In fact, we might be kind of a smallish proportion of the population of heaven. It's not all about us. I mean, except, well, yeah, the plan of salvation is all about us because we're the sinners of the universe. And God cares about us. And he cares about the, the ones in trouble. He spends more time and energy than all the ones that aren't in trouble. Things are going good there, but he's looking out for us. Uh, Romans chapter 3, verse 4. Well, I'm going to back up one verse. For what if some did not believe? Will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? Certainly not. Indeed, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and may overcome when you are judged. This is talking about God being judged. You realize that God is going to be judged in the final judgment. The whole universe has a question. Is God really good, loving, and fair? He says he is. Devil says he's not. Who's right? Is God good, loving, and fair? The answer in Scripture is yes, he is. Uh, and I trust that that is absolutely correct. But there is a formal judgment that will look at that exact question. Is God actually loving, good, and fair? Has he always been? loving, good, and fair to everybody in every circumstance? The answer again is yes, but there are some moments where it's a little awkward to actually demonstrate that clearly. I mean, there, there's spots that are a little awkward. Uh, it remains true that he is, but the uh, judgment is going to look at God himself. He is putting himself out on trial before the universe. You guys get to decide whether you think I'm good or not. We all get to do that. For us, in, in our part in the judgment, when our cases come up, the basic question is, 
Who's a follower of God? Who has faith in Jesus? Um, And out of that, we answer the question, who is going to be in God's kingdom? Who is going to receive eternal life? The reality of our relationship with God and our claims about our relationship with God are not always the same, and that is going to be examined in the kingdom, in the judgment. Are we really his children when we say we are? Does our life give evidence that we are? The um, Bible says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It goes on to say, We are his workmanship, his masterpiece, created for good works. What does God want to see happen in us after he takes over in our lives? Good works. If we're his masterpiece, what's a masterpiece? That's your finest work you do, isn't it? We are the finest work God does. Go ahead, snicker a little, right? (laughs) Us? Us here, we are his finest workmanship. Well, not in our natural state. No, 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 no. Not in our natural state, but what he does with us through the grace of Christ. We are his masterpiece with the net result of good works. And so the Bible can say that we are saved by grace through faith, and we're judged by our works. How can we be judged by our works, but not saved by our works? Remember the story of Rahab. Now, I've shared this with some of you guys, okay? but I think there's an awful lot of new people in the Sierra Vista Church for, since the time I think I shared that. Uh, I call it the gospel according to Rahab. Remember what happened with Rahab? The spies came in uh, to her place, And uh, she's talking with them, and she says, we all know your God's going to win. I don't want to die. My family doesn't want to die. I'll spare your life if you spare mine. They said, that sounds like a decent deal. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll do that. We'll do that. Cops knock on her door. Yeah? Oh, those guys, those were spies? She knew. Oh, they took a run for the river, and if you chase them fast, you might catch them before they get across the river. No. She just hid them under the flax on the roof of her house. That was a what? A lie. Do you get a gold star for a lie? That bothered me for a long time. Okay, some of you it's okay. You can say, yeah, sure, I'll give her a gold star for a lie. But the way my personality is put together, I can't do that. I just can't bring myself to say you get a gold star for a lie. And so I had a real trouble with Rahab's case. In fact, in Hebrews it says, by faith she received the spies. It didn't say by faith she lied about it, though. (laughs) So what about this lie she tells? When we get to the judgment, and we're reading the story of Rahab, if we're in the committee that's judging Rahab, what do we say? Look what she did. She put her life on the line. She could have got killed for what she did. Lie or not lie. She protected the Israelite spies, and what she did showed what? Her faith in God, right? Even though it's a lie, it showed her faith in God. Follow me? Do we need to give her a gold star for the lie? No, we give her a gold star for the the faith that was evidenced by the lie she told. Okay, so far? You good with me? Okay. Now, let's flip that back around to us, me. Anything good I do for God, what is its merit in the judgment? The same as Rahab's lie, right? No gold star for what I did. It is what? Evidence of faith. Evidence of faith. It doesn't earn anything, doesn't merit anything, but it shows 
it shows where our heart is. It shows the nature of our walk with God in Christ. Make sense? Gospel according to Rahab. Good for me to be reminded of that now and then. Uh, that's what our good works are worth. Now the Bible tells us there will be two kinds of people when Jesus comes. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be when Jesus comes. Genesis chapter 6 Verse 5 and 6. It turns out that as we get closer and closer to the second coming, everybody tends to be more and more either with God or against God. We, we solidify one of those positions in our hearts. Genesis 6, verses 5 and 6. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. And then verse 7, he says, I'm going to destroy all life from this earth. And I'm going to start over, except Noah. And he built an ark, and those who went into the ark with him were saved. Verse 5, it said, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil, continually. If you unpack that a little bit and flip it around, I think that just said they never even had a good thought flip through their brain. Every thought, every intent of their thoughts was only evil continually. That's the way the population of the world not aligned with God is going to be in the end times. And Luke 7 tells us the flood came and did what to them? Destroyed them all. Destroyed them all. John chapter 3. John chapter 3. Verse 19 through 21. And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they've been done in God. What do we do with the light that God shines into our lives? John chapter 1 says that Jesus is the true light who lightens every man who comes into the world. I believe that is saying everybody has some light. Now, in some lives, I can't figure out where their light is. I can't see it. It's too small, and I don't know how to find it. People who've never heard of a Christian, never seen a Bible, never been around anyone who believes in God, living out in the jungle somewhere, animists, I don't know what light they saw. But the Spirit spoke to that heart somewhere, sometime. And in the judgment, the question is not going to be, what did you know? Or what light did you have? The final question in the judgment is, what did you do with the light that you had? Lots of light, what did you do with that? Very, very little light, what did you do with that? Uh, one of my favorite stories on this point uh, comes from early missionary times in Hawaii. Uh, and one of the uh, Hawaiian women who was uh, a friend of the missionaries decided that the power of, of the Christian God, uh, she was going to invoke his power to uh, stop the violence of the volcano right there beside where they lived. So she climbed the mountain, ate 
the sacred berries reserved for Pele, the god of fire. She was never supposed to touch them or eat them, but in defiance to the god of fire, she ate those berries and then she recited a prayer asking God to stop the violence of the volcano. You would know the prayer she prayed. You will recognize it. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P. She recited the alphabet. She thought it was a prayer. What did God hear when she prayed that prayer? He heard what she intended to say. Please deliver us from the power of the volcano. And God did. Stopped it. Done. How much light did she have? Mm, if you don't know the difference between ABC and a prayer, you don't have an awful lot. Right? Give me that one. Not an awful lot. But the question isn't how much do you know. It's do you come to the light or do you pull away from the light? Do we come to the light because we want to be with God and like God? Or do we pull away because it's uncomfortable? Adam and Eve, when they heard God walking in the cool of the evening after they had sinned, they fled because it was not comfortable being in his presence. And so do we turn toward God or do we turn away from God? And that's where our life comes in. We can see that. In the things we do, the things we say, the choices we make in our life, it shows whether we're pulling toward the light or pulling away from the light. John 14, not John, sorry, Revelation. Revelation 14. Verse 4. It's talking about the 144,000. These are the ones who are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. This is symbolic. Revelation is a very symbolic book. Uh, and we've been talking about the women, uh, the pure woman, uh, and the woman who rides the beast. They all show up in here. It's really talking about churches, religious organizations, uh, and are you following truth or error? Um, these are the ones who follow the lamb wherever he goes. These were redeemed from among men, being first, first fruits to God and to the lamb. They follow the lamb wherever he goes. Remember the little uh, nursery rhyme, Mary had a little lamb. Its fleece was white as snow. And everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. Uh, years ago, Morris Vendon pointed out that here in Revelation, it's not Mary had a little lamb, it's the lamb had a little Mary following him. We're the little Marys following the lamb. It's the other way around. We follow the lamb. The lamb doesn't follow us, we follow the lamb. Uh, and if we're following the lamb, it is evidence that we are God's children. That's what they're looking for in the judgment. Now, there's three phases of the judgment. We're not going into the history uh, and the, the, the dating of when the judgment began in heaven. Uh, some of you know that. Most of you know that. Uh, 1844, at the end of the 2,300 days of, of Daniel 8. Uh, it's been going on for a while. Um, and uh, Revelation 22, 12 tells us, Behold, I'm coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. The eternal rewards for life or destruction are already decided before Jesus returns the second time. So that's what they're working on right now. Who's going to be saved and who's not? Uh, but there's another side to that current part of the judgment. Remember Abraham. He lied about his wife. Didn't show faith. And uh, do we want liars in heaven? God says very distinctly in Revelation, no one who loves or makes a lie 
will be there. They, they don't enter God's kingdom. It doesn't happen. Uh, so <clears throat> the, the rest of the universe knows what my cousin did, even the stuff he didn't tell me. And they know what I did, which I didn't tell. I don't think I told him. Sure, I didn't tell my grandma. <laughs> But the rest of the universe knows these things about all of us. And sin is a problem that has been quarantined to this world since it began here. It's not loose out there. It's loose down here, but it's not loose out there. They don't want it loose out there. Are we actually safe to allow into heaven? In the minds of the rest of the universe, that is a legitimate and real question. How about Moses? When he thinks it's time for Israel to leave Egypt, he finds an Egyptian smiting a Hebrew. He looks around, and there's only three of them there. He kills the Egyptian. He's not going to talk. Moses is not going to talk. He assumes the Israelites are not going to talk, but he did. It got out. He had to run for his life, live in Midian. I don't think God wanted Moses to do that. He was off by 40 years anyway. He had his timing off on the the promises that God gave to Abraham. Uh, He was jumping the gun, and he was doing it by his own human power. He had military training, and he figured that he could lead an army of Israelites in battling their way out of Egypt. God says, no, Moses, we're not going to do it that way. Wrong way. That might or might not be successful, but we're going to put something on the record that shows who I am, not who you are. This is about what God can do, not about what Moses can do. So there are legitimate questions about some of the redeemed. No, let's rephrase that. There's legitimate questions about all of the redeemed in the minds of the rest of the universe. They need to have that settled before they open the gates and let us all in. They need to be completely comfortable with all of us being there. They will be. But part of that is being worked out in the judgment now. Who is going to be there, and is that okay? Is that okay? And then in Revelation 20, it talks about the redeemed sitting on thrones and judging for a thousand years. 1 Corinthians 6, 2 and 3, Paul says, The saints will judge angels and the world. Well, fallen angels and the lost world. Because before we get there for for the thousand years, who is saved and who's lost is already decided. That's not the question that we're looking at. But there's going to be questions we're going to want to look at. Just like the rest of the universe wants to know, are we really okay? Are we really cured of sin? Are we safe to let loose in the rest of the universe? But during the thousand years, we will have questions that we need to have answered before the end of sin forever. There may be people we were very confident would be in heaven who are not there sufficient to shock us sometimes. What are we going to do with that? We're going to go over the cases and see exactly why God made that call in that life. One thing we know, even before we go into it, is God has always done the most loving thing he can for everybody under the circumstances as they come to him. We make choices, uh, and he doesn't control our choices. He gives us free choice. But God always does the most loving thing he can. Um, If my mother's not there, i got to know why. I fully expect her to be there. If she's not there, I'm sure I will understand. Not now. I I can't see it now. (laughs) No way I can see it now. If she's not, there will be reasons that are clear to me when I go over the record. 
So I think part of what we're doing is we're settling our own questions about the people we knew who aren't there. Did God give them all a fair chance? Well, I can tell you in intellectual theory, absolutely he has. But the emotional side of that needs to be resolved too. We've got to deal with who's not there that we thought would be there. Was God actually fair? Is it correct for each of the lost that they not be in God's kingdom? Uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with C.S. Lewis. Uh, he was a, a bit popular when I was in college. An uh, Englishman who uh, started out probably agnostic or something like that, became a Christian and, and wrote a number of very interesting books. Uh, one of the books he wrote was called The Great Divorce. Now, he believes in uh, the eternal spirit of a man, and that's not what the Bible teaches. So the, the scenario in his book is built on wrong theology. But if you filter that piece out, he has very interesting insights into why people choose not to be in heaven. In his scenario, in hell, there's a bus. Runs every day from hell to heaven. Anybody who wants to can get on the bus. They can go there. They can stay as long as they want. They can come back if they want. Whatever. The bus runs every day. You can go up to heaven. Check it out. So, he puts himself in the story. He rides the bus up to heaven. When he gets there, he's watching everybody else get off the bus. Uh, and one guy is a thief. And he sees golden apples. Ooh. If I could get one of those down there, I would be rich for the rest of my life. Rich. But of course, in, in the scenario where these are disembodied spirits, the apple is even kind of super real, more real than one here, and he can't even budget. I'm trying to drag this apple back to the bus, he can't, he can't even wiggle it. Although C.S. Lewis says, I thought maybe once it did wiggle just a little. <laughs> then there's this big booming voice that echoes out across the landscape. Fool! You can't take it with you. But if you stay here, you can have all you want. Right? Right. He dives into the bushes, terrified, shaking like a leaf. After it calms down, he sneaks out again, looks around, grabs the apple, tries to pull it back there. He's not changed. <laughs> he doesn't want to stay in heaven. He wants to take something from there back down to hell. Uh, another lady who rode the bus, uh, it turned out that her son had, had probably died in childhood, and she held it against God ever after. And she was demanding that he be given to her to take back to live with her. He's, he's in heaven, the kid is, right? And, and I think her husband has to greet her and try to talk her into staying because you can see him and be with him forever if you stay here, but you can't take him back with you. She's so incensed that she can't take him back with her. She storms back onto the bus and goes back. Yeah. Interesting and I think the, the kernel of what he's saying is true. That is, people who are not in heaven are not in heaven because they would not like heaven if they were there. They couldn't be happy in heaven. Couldn't be happy in heaven. And God won't make you be someplace where you're unhappy forever. That he's not okay with. You have to be okay with his ways of doing things. And if you are, you're fine. If you're not, you won't be there. He won't make you be there. Uh, you don't have to go to heaven if you don't want to go to heaven. We all have to make that choice. Then, at the end of the thousand years, there is the great white throne judgment. 
And that's the moment where all of the people who have ever lived on this earth are all together alive in one place at one time. The redeemed in the city, the lost outside, they've been raised again. The devil has been loosed for a little time at the end of the thousand years. They come up to attack the city because the devil says, look at how many of us there are. We can swamp their defenses easily. We can have that place. It's mine. It should be mine. It was taken from me unjustly. Let's go get it. So they come up to attack the city. And just before the fire comes down, there is the great white throne judgment, the moment where God opens up before all of the lost what he did to try to save them. The lengths he went to to talk them in to coming back. Remember at the Last Supper where Jesus says to Judas, what you do, do quickly. So I always used to hear Jesus saying, hurry up, man, get it over with. <laughs> we know what you're going to do. Let's get it done. And then one day, it flipped on me. And I heard it differently. And I can't hear it the old way anymore. I believe that what Jesus was saying is, hurry up, man. You've got a choice to make. And this is your last chance. Please make the right choice. Hurry and make the right choice. Because you're not going to get another chance. Jesus wasn't telling, go, go. He was telling him, please come in with me. You still can. You still can. And I want you to. What you do, which one you do, do quickly. That's God's heart toward all of us. He wants us with him in his kingdom. He's going to show everybody the whole history of sin in our universe, in our world, and their part in it. We, we all get to see our part in it when they do the grand replay. And Philippians 2, 9 says, Every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Even the wicked and even the devil will say, You have been right all along. But that's not something that comes from a heart that's converted. That's a fact that's forced out of lips that don't like that fact, but acknowledge that it can't be denied, can't be hidden. And the wicked will be consumed by the fire that falls from God. That third part of the judgment gives full, clear, final evidence to all of the lost, why they're lost, why they're not going to be in God's kingdom, you couldn't be happy here. <laughs> and I'm not going to make anybody unhappy forever. Not my way of doing things, says God. Not going to do that. Uh, and they will know that God was good, loving, just, and right in all that he did before they are finally destroyed. Before they are finally destroyed... Everybody in the universe will recognize and acknowledge that the most loving thing God can do for those who are lost is to let them have the choice they made not to be in his presence. Now, right now, God holds back his presence from our world because his presence in our world right now would destroy us all with his glory. As sinners, you know the old bug zappers? Yeah, that would be us if God came here in his full glory. And so, in order not to do that to us, God veils his glory, sends Jesus in human flesh. And God backs away from exercising his presence in our world openly. Self-restraint on his part for our ultimate salvation if we'll accept it. God 
does not intend to leave a corner of the universe he can't go into. It's all his, and he's going to have the whole thing clean and the whole thing perfect again, and he and the righteous can all go to any part, any time we want. He's not going to leave a corner for sin to hide out in. He's not going to do that. But before he eliminates that last corner, he needs to have everybody on board understanding that's the most loving thing he can do for everybody based on their own choices, what they want, what they've chosen. Is the judgment good news? I think it is. I really think it is. Even the part about looking at our record of our lives. Are we his? Does it show? The Rahab test. Right? Do, do our works show real faith in God? Uh, so some questions to, to ponder. Do you and I trust Jesus? Do you and I seek and keep the light that God is giving to us? Have you and I sent our sins beforehand to judgment? Send them now. Get them taken care of before the judgment is finished. Do it now. This is a good time to do it. Are you and I learning to reflect accurately what God would pronounce in the cases of lost sinners? There's ditches in, in, in human beings' beliefs. Sometimes we say, oh, God is so loving, he'd never destroy anybody. God is so loving, he won't make anybody continue to live in sin who doesn't want to let go of it. Um, others have said, God is so strict He's looking for a chance to squish you like a bug. Uh-huh, I saw that. <laughs> no. He took the chance for his son to die so we could live. That says where God's heart is at. Am I learning to judge sin the same way God does? Am I learning to be okay with God doing what he's going to do when he finally removes sin from our world and universe? Am I learning to appreciate his decrees and the criteria upon which he makes those judgments? Am I okay with it? Th those are good questions for us to ponder. Okay, so let me try that first question again. <laughs> How many of you want to hear the words, we're going to send you to the judge? Depends on which judge you're talking about. I'm talking about the great judge and the great final judgment. You okay with that? Going before the judge? Yeah? Amen. Lord, you have died that we might live. And we thank you for that. Teach us to abide in you as a vine branch stays connected to the vine. Live your life in us. Work your works in us. Shape us into your image, we pray, so that when you come, we will be pleased to see you come instead of afraid. In Jesus' name, amen.